EBS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Rochelle Travers and this is The Leader. The sirens heard throughout the streets of Kiev as Vladimir Putin declares war on Ukraine, shattering peace in Europe. President Putin of Russia has unleashed war in our European continent. He's attacked a friendly country without any provocation and without any credible excuse. Innumerable missiles and bombs have been raining down on an entirely innocent population. A vast invasion is underway by land, by sea and by air. Minutes after Putin announced a military operation, the first shelling and missiles were launched into Ukraine. Ukraine's foreign minister has accused Russia of starting a full-scale war and urged the UN to do everything possible to stop it. With numerous reports of attacks and explosions near major Ukrainian cities, the invasion is well and truly underway. But what exactly is Putin's strategy and can he be stopped? Robert Fox is the Evening Standard's defence editor. Robert, Putin has essentially declared war on Ukraine. How bloody is this going to get? I think it's going to be very dramatic for the next few hours and days. What Putin has announced is in old terms, and the Russians imitated the Germans in this, is a blitzkrieg attack. Bombing by artillery and uh, heavy weapons on the ground, a lot of missiles, including cruise missiles, and a lot of air attack. And we've seen most of the big cities have been selected for some kind of targeting. He wants to knock out Ukraine as a military power and really politically to make it a husk, really an annex to Russia, which will include removing the regime in Kiev. It's a very tall order and he's got to do it quickly before he risks getting bogged down. And it looks as if that could happen very quickly. What sort of firepower is Russia using? Well, it's using more than half its effective firepower because this force of 110,000, 120,000 plus ground force is really most of the effective army that can be manoeuvred. In other words, be moved around. Lots more army, of course, is being left in barracks and bases across what is the biggest political country in the world. But they have moved stuff even from Siberia, from the way, way east to do this. And that's why it's not quite a one-shot wonder, but he's got all this to use and not much more. If, if there's any major setback, and it's difficult to see how it would happen, but there's no doubt that the Ukrainians are trained and have thought out guerrilla delaying tactics, and that could be trouble. There isn't another big army that a Putin can bring in to mop up where the others left off, or the others may even, in some places, even have failed. And it's roughly about half the Air Force. And it must be said that the bits of Air Force that they have used in places like Syria have not been that effective or as effective as it should be, given the firepower. A lot of this, surprisingly, is quite old. And what sort of firepower does Ukraine have? Much, much smaller. The Ukrainian forces have improved a lot since they were caught out in 2014 and Russia, by stealth as much as anything else, took Crimea. But there's nothing like the firepower to have sort of tank contact, heavy confrontations. They've got quite a big army concentration of tens of thousands nearly around the southeast, the pocket of Donbass, which is wider Luhansk, wider Donetsk. And it's quite clear that the Russian command is very traditional. And it's surprising, after all that's been said and done with new tactics, asymmetric warfare, hybrid warfare, all this mishmash, jargon and junk, how traditional the Russian commanders are being. They're going in for a confrontation with the heavy concentrations of Ukrainian forces, primarily in the Donbass, and using, as I said, blitzkrieg, standoff, air attack, and artillery, and cruise missiles, which can stand off for dozens of miles, for uh, almost back to the Belarus border, and hit at these cities. Note what I'm not talking about. I think the Russians are very, very wary of committing their infantry, the Tommy Atkins, the average soldier, the G.I. Joe, the Ivans, as they're known in the Russian services. They do not want them to get 
caught in a lot of hand-to-hand fighting because that produces all kinds of problems that could spin off causing trouble well beyond Ukraine because, of course, it would have elements of a civil war. Many of these people will have cousins or best friends or study friends who are Ukrainians. They know Ukraine and they know the Ukrainians. It's actually, there's quite a lot that many of them, not so secretly, will like about the Ukrainian way of life. Ukrainians on the whole, as you get further west in Ukraine, are much better off. And the Russians know that. What does victory look like for Putin here? What does he want? Well, it will look like something that we've seen before. We will see him strutting with his goose-stepping soldiers and guards across um, a red square, and he will probably give another one of his weird uh, Harry Potter history speeches about how Russia is great again and is getting back to its birth rate because Kiev is very much part of it and Ukraine had no business even considering itself being a separate nation. That's the rhetoric. But The reality on the ground, I think, is going to be very, very difficult. I see he cannot escape the thing that he's trying to escape, which is a long occupation. If there's a long occupation, there is always the risk and likelihood of an insurgency. An insurgency is cousin against cousin equals civil war. Civil war in Ukraine could equal civil war in quite a few parts of Russia itself. I think that he may have, by sowing chaos, in the chaos, he may have sown the beginnings of his own downfall. Putin appeared to threaten nuclear war in his speech this morning. Is that a bluff? His speeches are very odd. They're they're sort of mishmashes of fantasy and they're mishmashes of absolutely downright deception. The trouble is, with propaganda broadcasts, fake news of all these propositions, it's got to contain not a grain of truth. This is the thing that real masters like Goebbels and Ribbentrop really knew about it in previous totalitarian regimes. It's got to have quite a high metal load of truth in it. And the trouble is that to all but the absolute faithful, the people who are dyed in the wool, Putin worshippers who really tasted the Kool-Aid, he's just sounding weirder and weirder and therefore less credible. So you can't take anything he is saying at the moment at face value. The UK and US appear to have ruled out military intervention. Can they really rule it out at this stage? Oh, they have to rule it out at this stage because this is the disgrace and this is the moment that we're looking at is the utter failure of NATO to give a credible peace and security and cooperation framework in Europe post the Cold War, post the wall coming down in Berlin Wall, that is, in 1989, and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, that is, communist Russia, in 1991. It had to show that it could build a neighbourhood of peace and prosperity, and it has misstep. It's provoked the Russians in this. There is a certain amount of that grossly mishandled, the most sensitive security area, which is the security area to the east. And it's time to start again on that, I think. For Britain, Britain has got to work out its own defence, security, resilience strategy. And it's got to go away from what we've been hearing, this sort of grand global Britain vision and really look after its own at home and abroad, which means the near abroad and Europe. And the models are the North Europeans, the Scandinavians, the Norwegians, to an extent the Swedes, but above all the Finns and the Danes. They do understand about this business of whole security. And when it comes to force, where they have been, may I say, quite stupid up to now, and were not helped by the mealy-mouthed approach of Biden and Blinken, never say never. And that's why Putin thought he got the green light to go ahead. Two things. He knew that NATO and the West didn't mean business, and he knew they were a bit of a dud given the disaster of Afghanistan last year. You can read more from Robert Fox on our website, standard.co.uk, where you can also follow our live blog for updates on Ukraine. And that's it from The Leader. This podcast is back tomorrow at 4pm.